Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our masterclass series. And the theme today is how to improve efficiency and save money in food production. So, uh, very briefly, introductions to, to myself and Dara. Uh, I'm Alan Kyo. Uh, I'm CEO of Crowley Carbon, and I've been with Crowley Carbon for, for seven years now, delivering energy efficiency in industrial facilities. Uh, Dara? Hi everyone, my name is Dara Tarrant. I'm an engineering manager here with Crowley Carbon. Um, thank you all for taking the time today to join us and hopefully we can convey some learnings that we have picked up over the years working across multiple sites and organizations and also just to say that we may mention our in-house analytics software clarity from time to time but that's just the platform that we use and there are many ways to achieve the same outcomes. Uh, albeit a bit more time consuming, but they're all well worth the effort. Okay, so to jump into it, so just state the obvious, uh, and uh, uh, what Julian talked about is a little bit about how you do things and connect factories up and do Industry 4.0. Hopefully, what we'll try and talk about is a little bit is why you would do this, and to, as I say, to state the obvious. Obviously, what everyone's interested in is driving continuous improvement in energy and sustainability and in process optimization as well. Uh, you know, big companies, a lot of all companies have big CSR targets, carbon neutral by whatever date it is. Uh, and they're really important, but also really important is driving continuous improvement on a day to day basis. And that can be hard. And we're going to talk today about some of the possible solutions uh, to, to improving that, that, that workflow. So just to talk a little bit about, we, you know, we talk all the time about 10X improvements in the tech world. So nobody would go back to renting a video and driving down to their local video sh shop and then forgetting to drop it back the next day and being fine for it and not having the video that the movie that you want to see, you know, streaming and Netflix is a 10X or 100X improvement over that whole experience. And we would never go back. Uh, but I suppose one of the things we believe or find is that really industrial energy efficiency and continuous improvement hasn't seen that 10X improvement probably over the last 30 years or so. You know, still factories are, are using PLCs and SCADAs and spreadsheets ultimately to drive continuous improvement. And they're all great, robust technologies. But really what we find with our customers is they're still using the same technologies, albeit an updated version of Excel and, and Siemens software, et cetera. So where is that 10X improvement and what does it mean? Well, one of the things it could mean is, is you know, using the engineers, the smart engineers that we have in, in facilities to, to do more interesting and valuable work than just gathering data, walking around, reading meters with a clipboard, data that goes nowhere, or if it does go somewhere, it's just typed into a spreadsheet and it takes half the week to develop those spread, spreadsheets and reports and then nobody ever gets any value from them. So instead of doing that, could we do something better is the question. And we do and also, well, Alan. Yeah, go ahead. Jim. Sorry, I was I was just going to say also, Alan. Like the majority of time, why this 10x hasn't occurred in in the food industry, I feel, um, is because usually there isn't enough resources uh, to hand to focus on improvement. So production is always king, and it always will be. But that leaves you know maintenance managers and facility managers overwhelmed with the constant need to fulfill production quotas. Um, but throughout this talk, we can highlight ways to overcome these friction points and most important areas to focus on um, going forward for sure so um we talk to a lot of customers in the food industry and other industries as well and obviously everybody wants to do continuous improvement and this is a reflection here of maybe the aspirational or theoretical continuous improvement process that people would like to have. So on the left hand side, you have all the potential data sources, you've SCADA, BMS, lab information system, various meters, utilities in your boiler, air compressors, you've got operator logs, you've got uh, supply chain systems, production information systems, ERPs, etc. Lots of data, potentially. Uh, and theoretically, all of that data gets polled continuously, automatically gathered, sorted, cleaned up to a central point, which is we call a collator. So that collator could be a person or software or, or a boat. And that collator is producing beautiful reports, uh, CSR, energy, production reports, consolidated reports. Uh, and then experts to, to descend on those reports and they, they pick through them and they see exactly what's happening and they can see opportunities for improvement and 
possible problems coming up. So at that point, they say, okay, we want to fix the problems and we want to take the opportunity. So we need to take some action. So the, the two routes of action could be operational change. So changing a set point or cleaning a heat exchanger uh, or CapEx. So spend some money on a new heat exchanger or a new boiler or a new air compressor or whatever it is. Uh, but on this route, you got to do detailed design. You got to implement it on this route. You got to uh, take action, make the change, whatever that change is. And on both routes, you've got to confirm the effect of that change. So CFOs give us money to invest. They want to make sure it's, there was a return on it. And with energy efficiency, a lot of the time, that can be difficult to, to prove the return is there because there's so many variables that can impact the, the process. And then you've got to maintain that over years. So that's the aspirational. The theoretical are, are the reality of what we see more often uh, and uh, pretty much uh, uniformly, it looks like this. So you might have a SCADA system, but you know it sits there in the control room. Nobody ever looks at the data on it, except for the operators who look at one or two key variables. The lab information system is not connected to anything. There's meters, but some of them are wrong and you don't have meters on the critical uh, steam users or electrical users. The utilities just sit there doing their own thing. The boiler, nobody ever looks at it. Operator logs, nobody ever collects them or, or, or collates them. Uh, and the production, all the production information, which you, you, gives context to all of this is it sits there in a silo and nobody looks at it. Um, they're manually collected. If they are collected, they go to various different people in the organizations who pr produced various different reports. None of the reports correlate with each other. So if you get to this point, it's very difficult to see problems and opportunities because you're just not getting the right data. It's not correlated. You don't have all the right context. KPIs don't tell you everything because they don't take into account all the variables. And if you get to this point, there can be a lot of fear of change. So, you know, changing that set point. Well, we tried that years ago and quality didn't like it. So they pushed back. So we're not going to do it again. And if you go the CapEx route, well, then, you know, there's not teams of engineers sitting around waiting to be employed on projects. Uh, and then if you get to this point here, it's very difficult to confirm the effect because you don't have the right meters, you don't have the data. And it's then, as a result, very difficult to sustain those changes over years. And this is an, an example of, of that kind of reporting dr drudgery that we come across a lot of the time. So various different spreadsheets that are collated and try, people try and correlate them. Uh, estimated readings, couldn't paste up to regional, couldn't paste up to corporate. Uh, and the whole cycle takes 30 days. And by the time you get to here, you're looking in the rear view mirror, you know, stuff that happened within shift is long happened previously beforehand. And your best engineers have spent hours and hours putting these reports together. And they're actually not actually analyzing the reports and the data as opposed to putting the reports together. Information overload as well. You know, this is a typical SCADA screen from a plant that we would operate in that has 30 of these screens, hundreds of tags, thousands of tags, just information overload. So how do you get, grab this data, but make sense of it so that it's actionable so you can take action from it. So ultimately all this means we find our customers uh, uh, they're driving in the dark a lot of the time. So, you know, big goals are set, CSR goals, carbon neutral by 2030 or whatever it is. Uh, but really the day-to-day -day incremental improvements and continuous improvements, they can't do it. So it's very difficult to get to the big goals because just data is just not available or it is, there's just too much of it to make sense of. So how do we improve on that situation is the question. Using the technologies that Julian talked about and, and engaging the people, which is we 100% agree with that as well. Um, so step one is to dig, start digging data out of dark corners. So we all know about air compressors down the other side of the plant that nobody's ever looked at. How do we dig data out of dark, dark corners in the OT realm, put it together and use it to drive peak plant performance ultimately? So this is where we are on the workflow, just to remind ourselves. So we're at this point here, we wanna dig that data out of those various sources and, and, and start putting it together automatically. Yeah, so there's a whole host of data available out in the field that we sometimes find are isolated. And to bring it back to Alan's point around the importance of a central collator, um, it is vital that all of these, all of this data that is available to you and your organization is collected at a central point. Um, and we've all heard the buzzwords like Industry 4.0, uh, Internet of Things, um, but simply put, they can be described as a central uh, collator. 
Um, so you may have assets out in the field like standalone controllers and boilers, uh, compressed air systems, standalone PLCs, flow meters, energy meters, and so on, all of which have highly useful um, data. And these data points can be easily harnessed and there's always a solution uh, for every type out there, whether it's 25 year plus old technology or mo modern technology. Um, solutions can include hardwired or wireless infrastructure and encompass all different types of uh, communication protocols like Mobbus, OPC, BACnet, and, and many, many more. And I suppose the important thing here is putting yourself in a position to take advantage of all of this data that you have available to you. So as a kind of a concrete example of that, uh, of what Dara was talking about, was uh, this is a situation we worked on a, a year or so ago where we were working in a plant and it had a very nice cooling tower with a very nice control system on it, but it was out the back. Uh, the PLC sat in the shed, nobody ever looked at it. Lots of instrumentation potentially, but it wasn't connected to anything. And when we connected it up and ran it through our performance algorithms, we saw that the cooling tower, the water coming out of it was too hot for the load on the cooling tower for the ambient conditions pertaining them on the particular day. And the cooling water was being used to drive vacuum in the factory. So the colder, the better. The colder, the deeper the vacuum, the less steam consumption would be in the factory. So when we hooked it up, ran it through our algorithms, uh, figured out it was not meeting performance, we went to investigate it. And as it turned out, it was just a simple balancing issue on the cooling tower. So we rebalanced the flow over the top of the tower that was stopping short circuiting happening. And we dropped the water temperature coming out by about four degrees. So about two days work, about a thousand pounds labor. And the impact was, was pretty radical or stark. Uh, so over this period of time, uh, you can see the cooling water temperature here dropped by about four degrees. The vacuum improved uh, significantly. And as a result, the steam consumption on this distillation process dropped from about 1.5 tons to about one ton over, over three days or so. And on that particular piece of equipment, it was about half a ton, but over the whole factory with similar pieces of equipment, it was about uh, two and a half tons saving. So it worked out at about uh, 250,000 pounds a year savings for about a thousand pound labor. And obviously the cost of connecting up the cooling tower. So it can be quite powerful pulling in these these silos into the an overall model to see how they're interacting with the overall plant and, and uh, judge their performance. So step two uh, is to uh, make sense of this new data. So you've got all this OT stuff hooked up, all the old compressors, cooling towers, production information coming in through the cloud. You got to make sense of it. Uh, and food and drink plants are, are complex and getting more complex. You know, there's more SKUs all, all the time. Plants are up and down all the time. The market is dictating uh, how the plants run. Uh, so they're getting more variable and more complex. So where we are in the process is, is here. So we've gathered the data and now we're pulling it together to make sense of it. So just to say, I mean, we're moving hopefully from a, a position of data scarcity where there was no data to hopefully not data abundance, which is like drinking from a fire hose. So you, you can't make sense of the data to, to data clarity. So seeing exactly what's happening in the plant and how it's performing versus its production rate or the weather or product mix. So one way we do this, and uh, Julian alluded to it as well, uh, so there's a lot of different terminology and buzzwords for, for this kind of process. There's digital twins, there's hybrid models, there's hybrid KPIs. But in, in essence, what they are is trying to distill down very complex systems into live targets for, for how the plant is running. So the process of doing that is uh, taking the design and operating data, so PNIDs, drawings, et cetera, building a, a detailed process model for whatever the process is. And that can be in Excel or it can be using other tools, more complicated tools like Aspen Custom, Custom Modeler. Uh, and then developing what we, what's called a reduced order model. So boiling it down uh, and getting correlations from the model and then putting those, those, those models into a live data stream. So you're pulling the data out of the plant, feeding it into the model, and then getting live targets for how the plant should operate based on the particular conditions on that day. So what that looks like in reality is something like this. So you've got, a, in this case here, a very complicated distillation process. Uh, and ironically, we are distilling that down uh, into a model. Uh, and we've got a live uh, platform here, which is basically 
running the model and it's been fed with the live data coming in from the plant, from the SCADA system. So pressures, temperatures, flow rates, et cetera. And it's saying for the conditions on the day, this is the optimal steam use. But you can see here, the actual steam use was this. So there's a gap between them of about a ton of steam. So about 200,000 euros a year in this particular plant. So the possible saving is this. So over a period of time, uh, the operators worked to optimize the plant, optimize the temperatures and vacuums. And you can see that the results here. So they're actually tracking the optimal steam consumption here. So that is basically their new target line. So they don't have KPIs, which you don't take into account the weather and the cooling water temperature and vacuum and everything else. They're actually running the plant on the optimum. And then you can distill that further across the enterprise. So in this case here, here's a, it was a, a, an enterprise with multiple sites. And this is a distilled down report, which is taken into account on the right-hand side, you can see the size of the bubble indicates the energy spend of the site and the color of the bubble indicates how it's performing versus the model. So in this case here, they're all doing pretty well, except for this one red site, which is doing not so good against the model, the predictive model. Uh, and that's something to look at, albeit it's only a small site. So the ones to look at really are the bigger sites which, which are drifting slightly. So step three, uh, having all this great information and reports obviously doesn't automatically turn into a savings. So how do we get the best eyes and the brains on that data, on the reports so at the right time to drive CI? So just to confirm, that's, that's where we are in the process. So we're steadily moving around. So if um, there was so, a... So yeah, we've, go ahead, go ahead there. I was just going to say, so we've underlined the importance of um, organizing your data. And once this is completed to a certain level, you now need a, a frictionless process of, of sharing that data within your organization um, and making sure the relevant people can access uh, data relevant to their expertise. So insights and collaborations can happen naturally. And look, if, if an in-house in resource is a problem, um, I wouldn't let that become a barrier, outsource this, this expertise and ensure that all this data is used to optimize your energy flows and, and processes. Um, if you want to go on to the, the next couple of slides, that's a similar slide to what you already presented, Al, is it? Yeah, so what we're saying here is, you, so you get a deviation, it pops up over the optimal steam use line. Um, you know there's something happening in the plant, maybe you know vacuum is drifting or there's a heat exchanger that's been failed. Then what do you do? And look, yeah, and, and just to follow on from that, from what Alan just said, a good simple example of this from a site that we were recently on, um, we worked with the site team, uh, we collated all the data from a process SCADA system and a refrigeration system um, that were siloed apart historically, but within three hours of, of analyzing this data, the refrigeration SME was able to flag certain inefficiencies um, around an 85 degree CIP system being used to clean out the primary site of a heat exchanger when it got fouled. Uh, so for years, the site had been bypassing that chilled glycol circuit away from, had not been bypassing that chilled glycol circuit away from the hex during the process, which happened a couple of times a day and led to chillers being under tremendous pressure um, to bring down the temperatures of that circuit. So that simple oversight led to around 25,000 of wasted energy a year, all because the data from the two systems were separated and were not being analyzed um, in the same location together. So the other thing to say here is <clears throat> it's important to have a tool that allows you to bring in that expertise in a frictionless way. So this is an example of a, of a Kanban uh, dashboard. So you can see here, so alerts pop up, you uh, you exceeded the air compressor consumption for, for whatever reason, it's over the predicted model. Uh, so the model has taken into account production and any other kind of variables that impact it. So then you can pull in experts here. So you can see, you can pull in these experts, but also when they dive into it, they can get all the data to hand. So in this case here, they can get all the backup data for the air compressor, so spec sheets, they just click on that everything's to hand so they can read themselves into this problem or opportunity really, really quickly. And also all the performance data is to hand. So you can see here, these are performance graphs for the air compressor. So kilowatt hours per meter cubed coming out of it. And you can very quickly spot what the opportunity is. So they can either take that opportunity or fix that problem as quickly as possible. 
So step four is, um, as we talked about, uh, there can you can do all that stuff really well, uh, and there still be some resistance, whether it's you know not having resources, or we tried this in the past and it didn't work, or different stakeholders in the company like quality or whoever it is, uh, not wanting to change. Uh, so there has to be a system around developing a bias towards actually, you know, you've done all the hard work of gathering the data, you've built the models, you've brought the experts in, now we've got to make the change. Yeah, so look, we, we can all think of certain examples where practices or equipment may be deemed uh, too much hassle to change or approach from a, a different angle. Um, and once this line of think, thinking gets embedded, it, it's very difficult to turn it around. But change and trying new ways of doing things is vital to, to any organization. And having the ability to prove whether this change or new approach was successful or not is also vital. Um, even disproving something is valuable. You can put a line under it and, and you can move on. So if you have the ability and the resources to build a, an integrated model of your process, this can lead to uncovering solutions and give you the chance to trial a, a different approach and either bust a longstanding myth or you know, proving it to be true. So a, a good example of this for me recently came up while working with an organization that had installed Venturi traps seven years previous and had removed them after only three weeks because of the problems they had, they had encountered. Um, so they had this negativity attached to them that embedded within the organization. The problem, the main problem there was, you know, they, they, did they size them properly based on historical data? Did they carry out a controlled trial uh, to truly see the impacts and you know the simple answer was unfortunately they didn't but they did work with us and, and gave us the chance to, to reapply or redo this and so by leveraging all the relevant data getting um, a relevant SME to analyze it and design a solution and accurately reporting the impact you know we found a 14 percent increase in efficiency was realized and that myth that was ingrained in the company was um, was busted there and then uh, to the benefit of, of the whole organization. So <clears throat> the other thing to say is <clears throat> before any change is made, obviously it's very important that stakeholders are brought along. So all the various stakeholders in the plant, and but everyone is clear on, on possible unintended consequences. So is there an impact downstream? And as we said before, plants are complex. So being able to understand the plant fully uh, really means that you've got to get into granular detail. And the way we would do this typically is, you know, build PFDs for the plants. And, you know, hopefully the plant has PIDs and PFDs existing, but a lot of older plants don't, or the plant has changed so much that the PIDs aren't updated and they're completely different. So get a fundamental understanding, build PFDs build the process model. So either using, you know, uh, Excel or, or something complicated like uh, Aspen Custom Modeler, it's a complex process, and then getting a full mass energy balance. So this is an example from a, a dairy plant where we, we sat down with the customer, we built this mass and energy balance over a period of uh, a couple of weeks, to get a fundamental understanding of what was going where and what heat was being exchanged with, 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 with whatever streams. Uh, and it was a really powerful exercise. The customer actually got a fundamental understanding of, of their plant, which they hadn't up to that time. But it allows you then to, to understand possible interactions, un, unintended consequences, and be able to foresee them and predict them. And then in that case, uh, to make the change, you can build process trials. So with quality, you can build process trials, like you know, making sure you're uh, doing the right analysis, the lab analysis, the quality analysis, that the frequency of doing that analysis is, 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 is agreed and checked. You're doing it as frequently as you can. You're monitoring certain parameters to make sure that there's no knock on effects downstream. So you're doing it in a structured control fashion using the mass and energy balance, using data coming from the plants that you've, you know, you've already gathered. So you can see everything and you can see everything downstream and you can bring on board the quality people have required. Okay, so this is another good example of leveraging data that was siloed on its own, um, collating it into a central point that relevant SMEs could access easily and optimizing this system to achieve uh, 38,000 in savings. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Al. So site ran this particular refrigeration system in a certain way because they always felt that the cooling tower could not handle the cooling uh, load required on its own. So they always ran two mechanical chillers, 
hundred percent of the time alongside it. Um, the system was properly analyzed and a model generated that indicated that at certain times, depending on the wet bulb temperature, the cooling tower was you know, more than capable um, of adequately handling the load. And by running the mechanical chillers when not needed, you know, this was running up a, a 38K bill of, of wasted energy, essentially. Um, so taking the time to analyze, design and measure the impacts of changes made, this will increase you know, your confidence and the confidence of, of the people you were reporting into um, and make to make more changes in the future. So, so step five, uh, the final step um, is making sure all that value and change is uh, sustained. And as we say, low hanging fruit tends to go back. Low hanging fruit is great, but it does tend to go back as does high hanging fruit. I, if you've made the change for the heat exchanger, you've put a heat recovery loop in to recover some heat from some process stream, it can get fouled and bypass and then it's not doing anything. The other way of looking at this is why is it that your CFO hates energy and efficiency investments? Uh, energy efficiency is more difficult than solar. For example, just putting solar panels on the roof, it's pretty non-intrusive. Um, and you know, once the sun shines, you get the savings. Whereas energy efficiency, you tend to be able to have to you know take the plant apart with its a refrigeration plant, put it back together in a, in a more optimum way, and that's intrusive and it takes a little bit of time. And then the savings that accrue from that can be dependent on weather, can be dependent on production, can whatever it is. Um, so, how do you make sure that that low hanging fruit does not grow back? So, how do you confirm the effect in the first place, but then sustain it over the long term? Um, yep, so you can see, so this shows the importance of continually measuring and reporting on changes made, um, not only to positively, rep positively report the changes, but to also ensure you sustain those savings. That's, that's the important thing here is once you get achieved those savings, you got to ensure that you sustain them. Um, so you can see the trend graph in the bottom left hand uh, corner there. It shows the modeled chiller consumption of how it would be running if changes were not made. And you can see that in red um, versus the trend of the actual consumption when the improvements was made and the clear difference between how it was consuming energy um, to how it is consuming energy now. So being able to close that gap via building good working models is, is really essential. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide up. And yeah, so to ensure you sustain these positive changes, um, you can set up watchers or alerts that will alert or alarm you if, if multiple conditions or thresholds are met. And this allows you to keep on top of any deviations and ensures that you sustain those savings long into the future um, and sustain the, the confidence of the relevant stakeholders. So yeah, so just to add to that, so all the work done previously on building the fundamental understanding of the plant also comes into bear here. So you can use those models for the measurement and verification process of the savings because they take into account everything, as I say, weather, production, product mix, et cetera. So once you account for all them in the model, you can then use them for the measurement and verification of the savings and then prove it to your CFO that the savings are being achieved, even though they're maybe not exactly on the bill because production has changed in the, in the interim or seasonality or whatever it is. So uh, wrapping up, uh, you'd be glad to hear. Um, just to talk about some um, some numbers uh, and some kind of low hanging fruit uh, that we've seen in our experience um, and opportunities that might be available. So utilities generally, uh, starting here, are um, pretty neglected. You know, the, the boiler man that used to be there all the time retired five years ago. Nobody really understands refrigeration anymore. Uh, so utilities are a big opportunity and they consume most of your energy. So they really should be looked after. Uh, and we find typically about 55% of boilers and cooling towers are not connected to a central point, whether it's a central SCADA or some other system. And that's an opportunity from an efficiency point of view. 50% uh, of critical steam users are typically uh, metered, and that's a big opportunity. You know, if they're consuming most of your steam, you should know what's happening with that user. And then if you have a SCADA, typically we find 20 to 40% of the control loops that are in the SCADA currently are in manual or they're poorly tuned. You know, the valves are, are oscillating and banging. You don't have a good process control and they're chewing through more steam than they have to. 
Uh, as we mentioned, uh, there's a huge opportunity cost in tying up resources in data collection and reporting, manual data collection and reporting. You know, there's probably a 3x uh, opportunity cost for taking that time that they are using with those drudgery reports, developing those reports and generating them to actually getting to do engineering work, looking at the data, looking for opportunities. Uh, typically, 80% of plants don't have detailed mass energy balances, uh, so the fundamental understanding of what's going on in the plant is, is not there, and therefore the interactions and the opportunities. And 90% of plants we find are using static KPIs, and they're better than nothing, you know, just dividing the kilowatt hours by uh, over the, the production tons or units or whatever it is. Uh, but there's a real opportunity understanding what exactly how the plant is performing and having a target line to, uh, to, to, to drive towards and having the operators drive towards. All that adds up to about 100 to 500,000 euros a year, depending on the size of the plant, but typically it's in that range for, for not a lot of investors. So we talked about at the start about a 10x improvement, and if we had that 10x improvement in, in our working lives, and not just in our consumer lives, uh, what would that feel like? Well, in our experience working with customers who, who get that 10x improvement, it, it feels like having a, getting errors back every day to do proper engineering work or liberating your engineers to do that proper engineering work as opposed to reporting. It means it feels like having all that data at your fingertips, clean, sorted and correlated, being in control when you go up to your quarterly meeting or monthly meeting with uh, with management and just having everything to, to hand, understanding exactly what's going on in the plant and why numbers have gone up or gone down. It means having trust in your KPIs because they're taking into account everything, all the variables. And it means knowing you can spot problems today within the shift and having that latency uh, very, very short as opposed to waiting six, six weeks to get the data and spotting problems. So in summary, but where we think we can go with industry uh, is on the right hand side. So clear motorways, safe motorways, um, you know, driving towards big CSR targets, but also daily continuous improvement. And not on the left hand side, you know, dark unlit roads, which are obviously fraught. Uh, and the tools are available, the methodologies are available to be on the right hand side as opposed to the left. And that's all we have time for. Uh, in terms of slides. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, and of course, we're, we're open for questions. So we did get a couple of questions there uh, during, that was great guys, by the way, thanks. Um, Dara, I think you did the myth, myth buster slide and um, yep. somebody said, this sounds like a good process, but time to do this is not there and getting outside expertise in won't be an option. Um, okay, uh, it's more of a statement than a question, but um, you know, well, getting, well, getting, well, yeah, well, just I, I have a view on that. Um, I, my view on that is that um, a lot of the time companies don't actually calculate the cost of the opportunity cost of having people do, you know, reporting and collecting information. So where we do this a lot with customers is actually just map out all those gaps in that process and put cost and time against each of those gaps and when you add it up it's a huge amount of money and it uh, it really makes the, the case for uh, doing something better whether that's getting external information or putting systems in place or going towards industry 4.0 or whatever it is the, the value is definitely there to be liberated yeah agreed Okay, great. So another one here. Very good presentation. Thanks. How do you find end user perspective in f and around cybersecurity in relation to other industries? It's a high priority. Um, probably one for you, Julian. <laughs> That's possibly one for me, isn't it? Um, it's a very good question. Um, perspectives in food and bev. I mean, Traditionally, food and bev is, off, is often seen, it, it, food and bev is one of the biggest manufacturing industries, but they tend to ha also have the biggest sites, the, the, uh, the, the most um, legacy machinery, uh, and a lot of the different problems. So um, food and bev is, is particularly important. I think in the light of what's happened with COVID as well in the last uh, you know 12 months or so, um, I always sort of bring Germany into the picture in here, but as, as uh, food and beverage classed in Germany, and particularly in cybersecurity matters, as a um, critical national infrastructure, 
And I think the same things happened with a lot of our customers during COVID where um, they've had letters uh, from the government saying, you know, you've got to keep the lights on, fellas. Um, the, uh, we're, you know, we're classifying what you're doing as uh, critical national infrastructure now. So um, I, think, I think boards are beginning to understand the, the need uh, to start thinking about investing in security, and one of the um, one of the you know one of the great things about about things like saving you know being able to save money with uh, energy consumption is you can start using some of those um, savings and some of those discussions with those CFOs to start saying okay, let's now I can prove that we can be more efficient in this part of our process area. Um, we we can use some of the savings or some of those uh, capex budgets now to start securing some of the assets that we now know need to be more secure. So, um, and you, end users are very aware of it. So hopefully um, that's answered your question, Thomas. Thanks, thanks. thanks Julian. Yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can add to that as well. Uh, it's, as Julian said, it's a very valid comment. Um, but the solutions are out there. Uh, I mean, we, we have customers who are connected, you know, and they're pharmaceutical customers, uh, big tech companies we have as customers as well. Uh, and you gotta, you gotta jump through some hoops, uh, you know, where it's VPNs and other, other security measures, but we can, we can always get there. And it, look, generally the world is moving towards cloud. Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers from Google Cloud and uh, Amazon Web Services, I mean, there's a big bet that the whole world is going to move towards cloud. You know, SAP have cloud-based ERP systems. You know, the, the real lifeblood of an organization is their financial information, and, and that's been moved to the cloud. So, you know, the security is getting better and better all the time. Um, and uh, I suppose what we're not suggesting is that we jump in and start doing control. You know, that's, that's, another, that's another story again. And, you know, there might be even more... Um, concern around that, you know, so some some cloud analytics controlling your refrigeration compressor. We're, you know, we're not talking about that step. We think there's so much opportunity in actually just doing the basics right, as opposed to going to real time optimization. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> A couple more questions here. So, um, Paul Walsh wants to know how do you drive selling the benefits of improvements through sometimes negative directors, um, Alan or Julian, Dara? Um, so uh, if I'm just interpreting that right, um, the benefits of improvements through sometimes negative directors. So I, I presume that's related to, you know, how do you justify the value of, of doing this? Yeah. Um, Generally, and we have a yeah, we have a very granular, I suppose, process that we go through with customers. So I mean, there, there's different layers of value. So there's obviously potential energy savings that come out of this. There's uh, time and productivity improvements. There's potential process improvements. So it, it's a kind of a detailed exercise that we would go through the customer. It's a template that we would work through them, and basically it, it's going through that that workflow that we talked about. So the gathering the data, the sorting it, the collating it finding out what the frictions are at each point and putting some quantification on that, you know, so if there is people spending two hours a day, you know, walking around the plant, taking readings, you know, there's a value to that and them not doing that. If they're spending half their week uh, manipulating spreadsheets, you know, if we can avoid that, there's a value to that. And then we have kind of proven rules, rules of thumb uh, from being able to, uh, uh, you know, deliver energy savings, basically. Uh, so, you know, in the range of kind of... I think if I, if I could also just really just add to that, I think, you know, what Alan's saying is excellent. One of the things that I mentioned in my cybersecurity background originally, one of the things that it was always seen as a cost center. So um, a trick I learned from one of my uh, customers in food and beverage many, many years ago was, it's when you're selling the benefits of the improvements to the director, don't call it something that's seen as a cost center already. Yeah. Um, so with something like cybersecurity, we were saying, look, this is actually a loss prevention project here. We're looking to save money on, on, uh, on loss from all different kinds of processes and angles here. And then wrapping it up and presenting it in that way was quite an effective way of, um, of off, offset, offsetting some of those negative, you know, those negative directors and negative objections. Great. Um, so 
I don't know who wants to jump in. Are you available to implement the software and pay for it from generated savings? Oh, that's a good one, Alan Kyo, maybe? Uh, yeah, that's certainly a discussion we can have, yeah. Okay. Um, Julian, did you want to respond to that? Um, are you able to implement the software and pay for it from generated savings? Um, so we're looking, we're talking effectively now, we're talking about subscription-based models, I, I take it, rather uh, OPEX, rather than CAPEX here. Is that right? I, I, I don't know. So uh, Dragos, maybe you drop us an email. Yeah, I think he's talking about shared savings. So there's value delivered, um, you know, that the provider of the software or the system would take a share of those to pay to get remunerated. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, that, the answer is yes, yes. So will we just take one more and... Um, to the team have a go it appears that there is a lot to be done in general is there always an obvious first step in starting an improvement journey that's a good one yeah i suppose uh, we would say this but it's probably talking to us i would say <laughs> <laughs> the first step <laughs> <laughs> and um and to add to that i think um for us it's always visibility it's understanding actually what you've got that's going on out there. It's always the first step on the journey to be able to answer those questions. Because if you don't, if you don't know what you've got, then you don't know what the, the effect of changing something will be. Um, and we're getting asked a lot about that these days. Um, it, it's becoming more, you know, more and more of a, uh, of a problem as more folks. And I think as Alan said, you know, mo mo the, the boiler guy retires um, the, uh, the engineering teams have fewer staff um, you know, budgets for keeping the lights on. Um, you know, you've got, you've got to have that um, visibility on, on the systems and processes that you're running even more so now, so. Um, guys, are you okay to take one more question? Yeah? Sure. Okay, so I have brought in outside energy expertise in the past and have had more bad experiences than good. What do you say to that? I know what you're going to say, Alan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, that's that's always a possibility. Um, look, you know, uh, you would say that I would say this, but it depends on the on the on the company and the expertise you're bringing in. Um, so, uh, you know. To do a bit of a sales and pitch, all I can say is, uh, you know, we we have a lot of happy customers who we've delivered a lot of value to. So it's uh, it's getting the right team on board, I would say. And it's good to set set out goals at at the, at the very start. You know, set certain expectations about what you're looking for and what you know those those experts can can deliver on, um, and just make sure everyone's aligned from from the very start. Maybe you know implement a small POV so. Uh, Whoever you get in doesn't end up wasting your time if if they don't bring you what you're what you're looking for. That's what that's what I would advise on that. Yeah, and I I would add to that to say you know back to stakeholders. Um, you know if uh, if people come in with size twelves and you know say they're gonna take half the energy consumption off the plant and you know annoy people who've been running the plant for for ten years, you know uh, that engagement isn't going to be there. So. As Dara said, you know, starting small, getting some quick wins, having expectations aligned, which is why we do the gap analysis. You know, it's a very powerful tool for seeing the gaps first off, but also that the expectations are aligned. That you know, in the first three months, look, you know, we're not going to boil the ocean. You know, we're gonna we're gonna get these wins for you, these smaller wins, and they're going to build confidence. And those stakeholders in quality or maintenance, whoever they are, are going to see those wins, and then we go from there, or not, as the case may be. Julian, yep. one last one for you. Um, yeah. And it says, are people really spending money on IoT initiatives with COVID-19? I think, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, last year was was certainly, with talking with customers, about was about keeping the lights on and reducing, you know, the number of, uh, of products that they were making, keeping things simple. And what we've seen in the last, uh, in the last six months that, it, you know, it's gone beyond that. Um, now, IoT is not now not just a, uh, a proof of concept or a proof of value for some customers. It's it's going into actual production now. So, where we're seeing 
Um, enterprises reduce their spend on IT, you know, because they don't need offices anymore. Um, stuff's moving out their data centers into cloud all the time, into public cloud. So it's kind of freeing up some of the, 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 those budgets to invest in the business and the things that actually make customers money. So this is what we suspect is now, you know, driving those, um, the, driving those initiatives and then in, into, into production. So, um, so ab absolutely. And I think some of the, uh, the understanding around some of the OPEX capabilities really and using the cloud to fund those projects are now filtering through, um, you know, to uh, throughout the businesses basically, um, because folks have to become more, um, have had to become more agile and increase the speed of adoption of, of some of those tech so technologies and uh, services as well. So um, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely what we're seeing out there right now. Great. And this is not a question. It's uh, somebody, Philip Hughes from Glambia in Clanroach, and he said, I've had Dara on site in Glambia in Clanroach, and he has revolutionized our site over the last three years. Nice compliments for Dara there. Guys, uh, I suppose we could uh, wrap up now. Um, have you any final words? No, I think that's a good one from Phil. Let's all leave it at that and, and walk <laughs> leave away. Leave it there. Okay, I'm going to send a recording out to everybody um, tomorrow. We'll follow up with that. Julian, Alan, Dara, thank you very much. This has been great this afternoon. Thanks. And thank you, thank everybody, you. for joining. Thank, thank you, everyone, everyone, for attending. Yeah.